Hi all, how are you doing? For some reason, I really like burrows. There's something wrong with my brain, or I don't know what's going on, but I really enjoy them. I don't have much personal experience with them. I just think they're cool. So there's a couple pictures of them. And what I want to know from you is if a burrow is an X or a non-X. And the way you're going to do this is I'm going to give you some examples of what an X is and what a non-X is. I don't think you'll be able to tell it without some examples, without some data. And so let me give you those examples. So an elephant, an elephant's an X. A giraffe, it's a non-X. So I've given you two examples, and I don't think it's going to be enough for you to determine, right? You're not going to have a high confidence in your decision. So let me give you a few more. My two poodles, they're an X. A deer, they're a non-X. A parrot, it's an X. A mountain lion is also an X. And a goat, it's a non-X. So, I've given you a bunch of examples. What do you think? Is, it in, is a burrow an X or non-X? And my question, I guess, might be that, you know, what happens if I give you more examples? Do you think you'd be more accurate? If you had more examples, would you be more confident in your decision? And I'm guessing you'd think yes. So let me give you some. So here they all are. There's categories on the left, which are X, or animals on the left are X. On the right, non-X. By now, you probably figured it out. So an X means a cirrus, if that's how you pronounce that. And that means without horns. Burrows don't have horns, so burrows are an X. So if you figured it out earlier before I mentioned all this, when I'm pretty sure you probably did, the question would be, well, how did you do it? What was the technique you used? So you probably looked at this elephant and you tried to think of all the possible features that it had and just kind of put that away. Made something maybe like a little chart in your mind, not quite this formal, but, you know, the elephant has hair, it has horns, doesn't have horns, rather. It eats herbs, it's an herbivore. It's a wild animal, not domestic. It doesn't have hooves. And now I, t I told you it had an X. So you're kind of building this along. And you're trying to come up with, well, what, you know, what, in, what column in this table gives it away? And we, turn, we found out that it was this horns one. Every time it said, no, they're an X. So here's another one that's much more complex, and you probably should pause the video at this point to think of, I have this non-Y and Y category, and what is it that makes this a Y? When do you say Y? And I'll give you a clue. It's not just one column by itself, but it requires looking at multiple columns. Okay, I think... Um, Hopefully you paused the video and kind of puzzled this out. But a Y would be something with hooves that doesn't have horns, right? Because I have, here's something that has hooves that does have horns, a deer, and it's not one. But I'm looking at hooved animals that have horns. So we can see that we have a label column here, right? Think something we want to predict, something we want to classify as. And we have a number of columns representing features. So elephants have hair, do they have hair, horns, eats, domestic, hooves? Those would be called features. So each row in this in this table represents a particular instance. There's relatively few features here, one, two, three, four, five features. But as problems get more complex, we end up getting more features per item. So in Pandora, this, they have this thing called the Music Genome Project. It has 450 features for each song. Features like the level of distortion of electric guitar, the gender of the lead vocalist. Does it have groove? What kind of background vocals does it have? On and on, 450 features. They hire professional musicians to hand label music. And the label is then for your station whether we should play it or not. Even a 28 by 28 small picture here of a digit that has 784 features, right? So we're trying to get what number it is 
based on the value of 700, the grayscale value of 784 different points. If we're looking at images and trying to look at an image, have a computer look at an image and say burrow or poodle, that, could, that image could be 4,032 by 3,024 by the three depth, the color uh, depth. So that's 36 million features. Now we're getting into lots and lots of features. So we could have thousands, hundreds of thousands of examples. So each 100,000 images. And we could, each image could be have 36 million columns of what it is. And what we're trying to predict maybe is what category. It's a burrow, it's a dog, whatever. Let's start with something a little bit easier and look at just two dimensions. So here we're in a two-dimensional space. I have a triangle here. And let's say they're, I don't know, let's say they're Uber drivers. If you can get Uber drivers these days. Um, and we're trying to find the closest one to go to this customer. So that's our task. So here I'm putting in a chart where they are and with XY coordinates, right? So the triangle is in one over and three up. Uber driver A is three, one, two, three, and five up, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So I've given the XY coordinates of both the Uber drivers and the triangle, the person that we're trying to, you know, find the who's closest to the triangle. And we can start computing distances, right? So we have this A person is four blocks away. We can't go diagonally on a street, but we can go two that way and two this way. So that difference is three minus one, two plus five minus three, another two, so that distance is four. And we can fill all those in and find the closest driver. That driver is C here, right? So one, two, three, he's closest to, and we could assign him to go pick up that person. This type of distance is called Manhattan distance. Manhattan because it goes kind of by blocks, right? So if we're viewing these as streets, we can't go diagonally. We have to go by blocks to compute the distance. If instead of that Manhattan distance, we thought, well, we can, can go on diagonal. These are drones and we're wanting you know, an Amazon drone to deliver a package to this guy, we could do compute the distance here and find the closest drone. Way, way back when you were in grade school, you probably learned about Euclidean distance and saw something like this, which gives the formula that if you have the y and the x, the distance of that angle, angled or the diagonal is x squared plus y squared the, and the square root of that. So that's what we're doing here. So we're applying that technique. So the diff difference between A and this triangle, there's 3 minus 1 squared. And then Y is 5 minus 3. So we get 2 squared plus 2 squared, which is 8. Take the square root of that. The distance is 2.82. So with Euclidean distance, we can just figure out that the Euclidean distance of each drone in this case and find the closest one to the triangle. That's Euclidean distance as the crow flies. These are two-dimensional cases, right? We have an X and a Y coordinate, but we can compute both Manhattan and Euclidean in any, any number of dimensions, five dimensions, 100 dimensions, three million dimensions, well, however many dimensions there are, we can compute the distance. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. So here I have people, guests, Ann, Ben, Jordan, and so on, and they rated on a scale of one to five different artists. So Janelle Monet, Anne Rated Four, Major Laser Five, Tim McGraw Two, Marin Morris One, and so on. And so we can see how they like different types of music. And now I want to find for Michaela here, who's the closest person up in this list to Michaela? Right? And then I also would like to find who's the closest to Brandon. So that's my goal. I want to find the nearest neighbor to Michaela in one, two, three, four, five dimensions. 
So here I've just turned it over so it's easier to fit on the screen. So I have Michaela here, her ratings of Janelle Monet, three, five, two, four, five, and four. That's right down here. And this is Anne's rating. So we're going to do the same if we're doing Manhattan distance, for example, we're doing the same thing. We're just computing how far away they are. So that's one away. That's two and th five. That's three different. So we just fill those all in. And we add them up. One, three, two, four, one, and get 11. So Anne is 11 away from Michaela. So we could keep going, find how far Ben was, Jordan, Sam, and Hun, I don't know how to pronounce that, <laughs> Hun So, and get the closest person, right? That would be the per closest person in musical taste to Michaela. And we can do that either with Manhattan distance, as we just did, or Euclidean distance. So we can apply these in as many dimensions as we want. Now, there's some similarity in Manhattan distance and Euclidean distance. They're one part of what's called Minkowski dif distance. Minkowski dis distance can be configured to be either Manhattan, Euclidean, or others. There's the formula. Now, you're probably thinking, uh, form it's a formula, and I'd like to skip it. But And it looks complex. But in reality, once you start dissecting these formulas in machine learning, they're pretty darn easy. So at first, they seem like, oh, crud, a formula, I'm going to skip it. But bear with it, work through it, and you'll see that it's easy. So let's go ahead and do that. If R1 is 1, these little R's up here and over there, then we have Manhattan distance. If R is 2, we have Euclidean distance. We could have R3, 4. If it's infinity, supremum distance. Supremum, di I don't know how to pronounce that either. <laughs> So, okay, let's do this. So, this is what we had before. And let's take a look at that Minkowski dis distance with Euclid with R of 2. So, here, Michaela Ann, that's what we're trying to find the distance of. And we just plug this in 3 minus 4 squared, 2 minus 5 squared, 4 minus 2 squared, and 5 minus 1 squared. Right, and 3 minus 4 is 1, that's 3, 4 minus 2, 2, 5 minus 1, 4. Then we square each one, and finally we get 30 and take the square root of it, and we get 5.48. So this looks really complex, perhaps to you, maybe it looks super simple, uh, but in, re in reality it is super simple, right? It's just kind of applying the general rule here of how to do the distance. So that's Minkowski distance. What we've just seen is what's called a nearest neighbor algorithm. We're trying to find the closest to some person. That you know, we're trying to find the closest to some object. This is often used in recommendation systems, what's called collaborative filtering. So if we can see, if we want to make a music recommendation for someone, we can see what other people with similar tastes liked, and you know, make those recommendations to that person. And we can also use it in, for classification systems. So here's Michaela. She's looking for an apartment and in the Austin area, let's say. And she's looking for a two-bedroom, two-bath, 1,600-square-foot apartment. That's kind of the, what she wanted when she kind of specified the search. And here's what we currently have in our system. And let's say we're doing a simple Manhattan distance here. So let's do that. So here the distance is 2. Right? Instead of she wanted two bedrooms and there was only one, so that's one different. She wanted two baths and there's only one bath, that's another one, and it matched her square feet perfectly, so it's a two, and so on. So we see here that, you know, maybe if we were just kind of eyeballing it and trying to help her as people, not as computers, we might represent might recommend mm, I don't know, one of these two, the West Koning or the Lavaca apartment, they seem to match her pretty well. This is two beds, two baths, just like she was looking at for, and it's a little bit big. This one here has one fewer bathrooms, but it has the bedrooms she liked, and it's you know almost it's close to what she wanted. But you can see that those didn't get weren't the closest. We would recommend this one she probably wouldn't want. She wanted two bedrooms, and we're only giving her one, and she wanted two baths, and it's only one bath.
The problem here is with scaling, that no matter what we put in these columns, they're so tiny compared to square feet that the square foot dominates the distance category. So if we have some a problem where some columns are in one scale, like these go maybe one bedroom to five or six at the most, the square foot can be, you know, you can get some pretty humongous Maybe the smallest might be 500 to 5,000, quite a big variant in square footage. So that dominates the distance calculation. That's not good. The solution would be to scale it so they all go from 0 to 1. So bedrooms go from 0 to 1, bathroom 0 to 1, square foot 0 to 1. That makes everything uniform. One method to use would be called min-max scaling. That's the formula there, right? We take this value x, which is the current value, like one bedroom. We see what the min is in apartments. Well, I guess you could have a zero bedroom apartment with a studio, but I think I was assuming <laughs> when I originally did this example that the minimum you could have is one. So um, it's zero here, and the max might be five for bedrooms, and the min is one, so four on the bottom. So we would do things, apply min-max scaling to all these columns. So I did that here. Here on the bottom is our current um, data in this min-max scale. It's scale all columns go from 0 to 1. And I've revised her search. So now two bedrooms is 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and 0 0.19. And now I find that the best match is that West Coning place. And also Lavaca comes up there as well. So now the recommendation system sort of matches our expectations. Before the problem was some columns were a lot larger, had larger scales than other columns. So let's take a look at Michaela again. This time now she's living in Las Cruces, so I've kind of switched it. And we're trying to make a recommendation to another person whether um, that person should live in Las Cruces or Austin based on using our finding the nearest person and make that recommendation. So one thing to note is that Michaela has relatives in Las Cruces. She grew up in Las Cruces, and that's where she chose to live. But you can see that other women who are single, <laughs> not retired, <laughs> who are fairly young, 28, this is on a scale of 1 to 100, have, I think that's about, this 35 might be, I don't remember, $80,000 salary, education level, master's degree, and so on. So we can see where people live. I have got rid of a lot of them in the bottom, but older people tend to live in Las Cruces. So here's a person, Maggie, and we're trying to see where she should live. And let's say she, this, I've arranged these here on the top in order of distance. So Michaela is closest to Maggie, and Clara, Maria are next in line, and Ben, Evelyn, and Dell are kind of the last of the, our matches. So we're recommending to her to live in Las Cruces. You can see there's a problem here because Michaela, who has relatives there, probably wouldn't live there normally. So it's really a bad recommendation since most of the people who are kind of close to her, to Maggie, would choose to live in Austin. So one solution to this, to eliminate these oddities, would be to pick maybe the top three people and kind of vote. So if we pick the three closest people, Michaela, Anne, and Clara, then we'd recommend Austin. If we picked you know the, the top four and voted, we'd still pick Austin. So the problem before was picking, you know, just sticking with the best closest person because people can have you know, that one person could have some oddities about them. So here in this approach with three, we're using k nearest neighbors, knn, that's the name of the algorithm, where k is three in this case. So we're picking the top three closest people or closest instances, and we're using them to vote on, you know, what our label's going to be. In this case, we're voting Austin. So KNN is K nearest neighbors. We've seen different measures of similarity. We've looked at Minkowski distance, which kind of encapsulates both uh, Manhattan and Euclidean. And there are other measures of similarity that work for other problems. We've 
noted that it's important in this case to normalize values, that we don't want one column to dominate because there's large values in that column. And we've also looked at that k part of the k nearest neighbors, that we're not just looking at the closest nearest neighbor, but we're looking at maybe the three nearest neighbors or the five nearest neighbors. And this balances things out a little bit better than just looking at that one nearest neighbor. So that's kind of the nearest neighbor algorithm. I'm trying to make it as clear as possible. It's a pretty simple algorithm, uh, but we'll go with it. So the k-nearest neighbor algorithm, I've mentioned XGBoost and deep learning are really the main algorithms today. But there are certain instances where the k-nearest neighbor algorithm performs extremely well, even though it's an extremely simple algorithm. You've seen, you know, like hardly anything to the dark algorithm. So it's used in search engines a lot. So when you're trying to do kind of a keyword matching type thing, it's pretty good in search engines. It's especially useful. It's kind of the state-of-the-art technique for anything to do with biology and genome sequencing, things along the DNA, RNA, binning. So we're trying to you know combine things. This is state-of-the-art, and it's a super simple, fast algorithm. So now, finally, after all this yakking on my part, we're going to switch and really start our hands-on component of the course to Google Colab. And that's what I'll show in the next video. Thanks.